Hi, and welcome, welcome to the Brookdale Visiting Writer Series show. My name is Suzanne Parker. I direct the creative writing program here at Brookdale, and I'm part of the English faculty. I'm very excited today to be talking to poet and memoirist Philip Schultz. Philip is the author of numerous collections of poetry, most recently, The God of Loneliness, New and Selected Poems. And he is also a memoirist with a new book called My Dyslexia. Philip is a Pulitzer Prize winning poet for his collection of poems called Failure, and also the founder and director of the renowned Writer's Studio in New York City. So a, an educator, a poet, and a memoirist. It is a, a pleasure to have you on the show. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I wanted to start by talking about your new and selected, The God of Loneliness. Um, I wonder what the experience was like of putting together a, a selected, a book of selected poems and kind of looking over the trajectory of, of your previous books of poetry. Um, what was that like and, and, and did you discover anything? Well, I've always hoped that someone would ask me that. <laughs> no <laughs> one's ever asked me that. It would be another poet um, <laughs> would, would think to ask that. It was very bizarre. I remember really? telling friends that um, you're going over your life. You're going, um, making a selection. They're not only selecting poems, but mm -hmm. experiences and chapters of your life. Mm -hmm. And it was a very odd thing. I, I, I know that other poets get a lot of opinions, and I mm -hmm. um, get a lot of conflicting opinions because, <laughs> you know, everyone picks a different as different favorites or whatever. It's like, mm -hmm. as my teenager son would call it, my best hits. Mm -hmm. You're picking that. Um, I didn't ask. Um, I asked one friend, and then I just thought I would do it by myself. And Because hmm. um, I knew from talking to others that it doesn't make any difference. People complain that you left their favorite poem out or why did you include that one mm -hmm. or so it doesn't it almost doesn't make it yeah. it's a very personal thing it's mm -hmm. i decided my wife felt i didn't include enough love poems she <laughs> it took a while to get past that <laughs> um but it is it is you are collecting it isn't just poems you're collecting those experiences mm -hmm. and you're wondering well, if you leave this one out, really, are you neglecting it? Sure. It's Did you think of it as, uh, as uh, this is my greatest hits, like, okay, I'm going to take the best from each one, or did you think about how it would represent how you have evolved as a poet? I probably should have thought that way. I mean, I, um, my editor um, was very flexible, and, mm -hmm. but that came into it. I didn't do that. I I felt that that isn't how I. That isn't how I wrote the poems. That isn't the way I see them. That mm -hmm. that if I suddenly became self-conscious in that way, in terms of, you know, posterity or any of that, that that would be betraying, the approach that went into oh. creating them. That I wrote poems most of my life as a way of surviving something. Mm -hmm. A relationship went bad and I would feel terrible and I wrote the poem to get over it. Mm -hmm. Someone would die, a friend, and I would write the poem as a way of dealing with the terrible grief. Mm. So it really is the new and selected kind of looking at your response to the experiences of your life and saying, which one of these moments will, will I choose and which one will will I not choose? Well, when I started to read them, I realized, oh my God, there are an awful lot of elegies. <laughs> or, and I, Was you know. Sex and some, death, isn't that what they say? <laughs> <laughs> some people, at least in the past, would see me as a funny poet, and I had mm -hmm. uh, um, amusing poems that would be, you know, I'd read them as a way of getting a crowd warmer. Mm -hmm. And um, I, find, I found myself not including very many of those. Or um, I, I was conscious that they had to be good yeah. and that this gave me a chance to revise myself that not all the poems that I thought. I don't have a lot of collections. Most mm -hmm. poets that I know my age have many more. 18 years between two books. Mm -hmm. I, that was a long time off. And I... Uh, 
take a long time with each poem. So the books tend to um, cover certain experiences. Mm -hmm. and I'd, like to, I'd like to ask you about that, though, because I did read um, that for 18 years, after two books, correct? You're right. And both of them award-winning books, too. So, you know, they had gotten some significant recognition. And then you stopped writing poems. Can, can you talk about that? You know, I've never successfully answered that question. <laughs> <laughs> and usually I come up with different answers because I don't really know. Hmm. I, you were writing. I though. was in analysis and I've examined almost every aspect of my life. But um, I can tell you what I thought at the time, which mm -hmm. I don't know how valid that is. I was unhappy and I thought, oh my God, um, most of my poems are about failed relationships and um, things not working out or memories that were dark. And I understand, I didn't know I was dyslexic and I didn't know, I didn't understand. I was looking at everything through some kind of psychological, poetic perspective that if I stopped writing about unhappy things, mm -hmm. I would be happier. Mm. Now, that's kind of embarrassing to hear myself say <laughs> that because it sounds so naive and simple. But I actually wanted to stop writing the kind of poem I was writing. Uh -huh. And you know something? It worked. <laughs> yeah. Because during that time, I um, went from an experience in teaching I didn't enjoy um, I, I, to starting my own school, which mm -hmm. is what I wanted, always wanted to do. I couldn't really do that in an academic setting. Mm -hmm. And I went to a very happy relationship. Mm. And um, starting the school and finding love and in a cliche sense myself, um, I didn't miss writing poetry. Mm. I tried my hand at fiction, which I was miserable at. <laughs> And um, that ended, and I was relieved. Hmm. I mostly didn't write. Hmm. I remember running into a, a poetry friend, and um, an older, wonderful poet, and um, he, he, he saw me at a party. He said, yes, you're not publishing, but you're writing. Mm -hmm. Very, very wild, wonderful spirit. And I said, no, actually, I'm not. He said, oh, well, of course you are. We all know you are. You're, you're, not, <laughs> you're not just, how do you not write? Mm -hmm. You're writing. I know you're writing. Sure. And I said, I'm really not. And then I would run into him again, and he would say, I know you're writing. Or he'd call me <laughs> up and say, <laughs> and I wasn't, and I didn't miss it. What brought you back then? I met my wife, and uh, we got had a, a, a wedding, and she told me to write something, that she's a sculptor, and she was going to write something about her process and uh -huh. asked me to write something about mine. And I, it was a paragraph. It wasn't yeah. a poem, really, and I just wrote something, and she liked it, and she encouraged me to, I guess. Um, and I was in love. I was madly mm. in love, and... Suddenly I was writing. I had to put it someplace. I mean, I couldn't just, I didn't know how to contain it. Huh. And I started writing again. And so maybe what I thought there was some truth in it, that um, I had also run out of things to write about. I didn't mm -hmm. want to write about the same stuff. Yeah. And uh, suddenly I had a whole new subject. But when you came back after the gap between those books, your style had changed as well, too, a little bit. Um, you know, you kind of, you, you were using those, beforehand it seemed more sort of ampersands, typographical and things and sort of staccato sort of phrasing. And it seems to me that when you returned, that had been stripped away. There was a greater sort of emotional intensity and risk in the poems. Thank you. And, right. and was that conscious? I, uh, you say, I'm going to put the ampersand away, I'm done. Well, the ampersand was a way of just going very quickly. It was like most of my poems were one sentence, yeah. and then this, and then this, and then this, and that's, that was my personality, and it allowed me, to, it was the only way I could experience things. It was, my life was like that. My life was a big ampersand. I would, one person to another person, and one experience to another experience, and 
everything slowed down now. I was not rushing past things. I was enjoying things. I wanted to savor them, and, and I wanted things to, I was enjoying my life. And um, we got married and had a kid almost immediately, and that was wonderful. And I had, um, you know, I wanted to, I was, everything slowed down. Hmm. Everything, this fast movie I had been living in, this character in this, with a lot of vehicles and collisions, and um, suddenly it was a different thing. And so poetry slowly evolved as a way of appraising and understanding something and looking at it, and I certainly didn't want ampersands. Hmm. I don't know if I was ever like that adventurous or um, experimental. Mm -hmm. I, it's just that that one thing I did, because yeah. that was how I saw everything. I'm thinking of it, yeah. They were all like one sentence. And now it was yeah. just a little more conservative, a little more slowing things down. So it was You more got the just best answer that I've ever heard myself say. So <laughs> I, and we I have did. it on DVD now. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably... I've tried to come up with fancier answers because I realized that I would sometimes disappoint people in saying something so prosaic. <laughs> But I think it's true. I can't seem to understand it in any other way. Well, I, this is a perfect place to take a break then. <laughs> <laughs> we'll hold on to that answer. I'm talking with um, the poet and memoirist Philip Schultz. We're going to take a break. Please join us after the break. <laughs> is a club where everyone is not exclusive to Asians can learn about Asian culture. We go on uh, special trips. We have lecturers come into our meetings. We have a meeting every Tuesday for about two hours and people just get new friends, learn about different cultures, learn about the history, religions, pop culture of different Asian cultures. It's really fun. I've made awesome friends. Mrs. Wang, the advisor, is amazing. She's the best person I've ever met, especially here at Brookdale. Um, it's a really fun time. Everyone loves it. It's really great. I get to provide the best healthcare experience for our patients. I get to give students the opportunity to be creative in all areas of the performing arts. I got my start at Brookdale. I got my start at Brookdale. The odds of a child being in a fatal automobile accident are 1 in 23,000. The odds of a child being diagnosed with autism, 1 in 166. The odds say it's time to listen. To learn the signs of autism, visit AutismSpeaks.org. It's never too early to start reading to your kids. Are you prepared for what awaits you? There are amazing possibilities when you open a child's mind to reading. Log on to the Library of Congress website and let the journey begin. Welcome back. My name is Suzanne Parker, and you are watching the Brookdale Visiting Writers Series show. I'm interviewing today author Philip Schultz, whose Pulitzer Prize winning collection of poetry is called Failure and is a beautiful book. And he is also a memoirist, and his book is called My Dyslexia, his memoir. So, welcome back. Before the break, we were, we were talking about your new and selected, which has just come out as well. And I was wondering, there, there are themes that you touch upon throughout all your books, kind of um, family and, and father and religion. And I was just wondering what your relationship is to these subjects. You know, how do they sort of percolate? When does it become a necessity to not only write about them, but within sort of your oeuvre to, to sort of reassess and write again about something? 
Well, I, I guess I can only really write about those things I feel most deeply about, most passionately about, and there aren't that many things. I mean, it's my background, my immigrant Jewish background. My father was born in Russia. I grew up in, you know, it was kind of a peasant environment almost. It's uh, very much of the, of the streets and, mm -hmm. and his longing to be successful and being out there and failing over and over again. And that's a subject uh, that has always meant something to me. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so for me, family writing was a way of trying to understand something and getting past it. And mm -hmm. it wasn't really until I turned 60 that I was able to go back. And I tried writing novels, bad novels about my father and that ex my childhood, and I never could, but I could in poetry. I mm. could in poetry. Why? I mean, one answer is, as, as it was pointed out to me over and over again, because I guess I'm a poet. <laughs> 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 that writing, stretching things out over a long narrative, but ironically, I'm, you know, the, in failure, there's a 50-page poem. And so poem. all yeah. the experience I had in writing fiction taught me how to write narrative. Mm -hmm. And I'm now writing a very much longer poem, a book-length narrative. Um, so the experience of writing fiction and telling stories, I, I come from a long line of, th these were, um, my father had five brothers and they'd get together and they try to top each other in storytelling. Mm -hmm. And they were all really good storytellers mm -hmm. and it was fascinating. And they're all their wives and were and kids were in the other room listening. Mm -hmm. And they were all, most of them would get together every year planned all year to tell the best story. <laughs> and I was hearing them, these great stories with all sure. this flavor and all this great charisma. And um, so I guess I fell into a tradition where it was, that's what I wanted to do. And I, after a while, you begin to see what happens to you, your experience mm -hmm. in terms of stories. You begin to become a character in your stories. Sure or seeing life experience as a story. Mm -hmm. And um, I was undecided. I, I do that in my poetry. There are often there are scenes, characters. I see the I um, as a character that isn't always me, that mm -hmm. this thing is happening to. And he's somehow narrating it. And I wanted to ask you actually about your, your relationship to the voice, the 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 I or the persona in the poems. Because I know for the writer's studio, which is this wonderful um, uh, studio in New York City um, that has sort of three levels of craft classes, if I remember correctly. Um, again, I think as well, the idea of the voice and the persona is, is, is integral to that curriculum and a study of that. And I wondered what your relationship was to that. Well, we have that. four levels, but they're oh, for writing. No, and, okay. and then I teach the master classes. And actually it's online around the world. And we have branches in San Francisco, Tucson, Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's an idea that I noticed when I first started. I've always been interested in teaching. Mm -hmm. I, I, when students I worked with used an autobiographical I, mm -hmm. and often the writing wasn't connected and it was flat. Mm -hmm. And when they took a character from a, um, used an I that wasn't them, like a character that would borrow from, a, like, Salinger, you would hold in Caulfield, it would come alive. Mm -hmm. And um, they, would, they would be able to say what they were really feeling mm -hmm. by pretending that someone else was telling their story. They had the mask. Yes, the mask. Yeah. And I um, always did that myself. I always, I fell in love with the first person persona when I would read. And I would always realize that that I probably wasn't the the, the author. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes I would meet the author and realize that they, it clearly wasn't the author. <laughs> I would be disappointed in meeting the, mm -hmm. the regular person rather than this I, this manufactured, invented, interesting mm -hmm. I. And it freed me up to, to do this. And... Um, yeah. So it's my teaching method, and it, it helps people um, 
say what they were really feeling Thanks. often. I wonder, as um, often so many people read poetry as if it is nonfiction. Um, and in Failure, you have that wonderful um, sequence of poems at the end where the speaker kind of alternates between speaking about dog walking and about speaking about um, September 11 and the person, this persona has had electroshock um, therapy and is in a psychiatric ward. And um, I wonder what your experience is of people coming up to you going, you know, oh, Philip, I didn't know. I mean, do you find that? Well, they're disappointed to hear that, no, I never <laughs> had an electroshock. I mean, I, I, uh, he passed away, a wonderful, um, a great uh, sculptor friend um, sought me out as a friend based on the fact that he had had that. Oh, wow. And he assumed I had too from reading the poem. Wow. And uh, I didn't, never had the heart to tell him that because it meant so much to him. But at a party once, he asked my wife, and she explained to him that I, uh, that I made it all up. Yeah. And he was very crestfallen. Yeah. I read a, after 9-11, I was looking for, it's about 9-11, it takes place, that's the backdrop. I was looking for a metaphor that would explain the shock we all were in. Mm -hmm. And I read a story about um, St. Vincent's Hospital, no more, but right mm -hmm. down the street from where I live. Yeah. Um, Clearing out everybody, the psych ward, the, the matter, uh, everybody thinking that they were going to get all these victims and sure. casualties and they needed every bed. So anyone who could walk. So I imagine someone having just had shock treatment being put out in the street mm -hmm. because that's the way I felt. That's the way everyone felt, yeah. that you couldn't absorb it. It was bigger, horrible news that you couldn't. Yeah. So I... That took five and a half years to write that poem, and at least three of those years went into finding the right narrator. Hmm. And I just lifted um, Binks Bowling from Walker Percy's The Movie Goer, hmm. his southern gentlemanly, um, sympathetic, humorous attitude was just right for um, that so this character. is really important to you to find the voice. I couldn't write it until that. I took the same with the poem I'm working on now. I needed a, I needed a character who, um, just so that it doesn't become an autobiographical eye. I think a lot of writers, you do it as much in poetry as you do it in fiction, just that poets aren't conscious of it. Mm -hmm. they, sometimes they can write and sometimes they connect and sometimes they can't. I think this is the reason why. Yeah, yeah. Fiction writers know that they need uh, a, a, a he and a she, yeah. and that they're looking at a character and they have a narrator. Yeah. Cheever used to create these great third-person narrators by first writing the story in first person, oh, wow. creating a very flavorful, interesting first-person narrator, and then using that narrator to tell someone else's story, and that, that would be his third hmm. person. Oh, that's interesting. Layers of distance. Yeah. Now, I wonder, um, we only have a few minutes left sure. in the show, but I'd love to see how that connects to My Dyslexia, which is your memoir about discovering that you are dyslexic and discovering later in life. And I, th I think there's probably a c clear connection between these. So in our last few minutes, can you maybe kind of describe the book and um, how it came into being? Well, I, I was asked to write it. It was the last thing I wanted to do. I... Oh. I, I, I I, I won this prize and um, the Pulitzer. The Pulitzer, <laughs> and um, all I wanted to do in every interview is talk about the fact that I was dyslexic, mm -hmm. which I had never done before. I didn't want to talk about my poetry, mm -hmm. um, and I had my I I was 58 when my son was diagnosed with it, and I realized that I had every symptom, and this explained why I didn't learn how to read until I was 11 and held back twice in the fifth grade and um, and uh, was in the dummy class. Mm -hmm. And I taught myself how to read, finally, because no one else could, by pretending I was this little boy who knew how to read. A persona. A persona. I created that. So I didn't realize until I wrote this book that my teaching method came out of how I taught myself how to read so I figured this is how I'm going to teach other people how to write. Wow. It was what all an incredible un journey, though. It was all unconscious, yes. And all survival, in a way, too. I yeah. was completely on my own. I, yeah, and back the, in the 50s in, in, in Rochester, New York, 
there was no knowledge of what dyslexia was. Mm -hmm. you, you were just put at a table in the corner and you looked at your teacher's back. There was no attention. You were on your own. Mm -hmm. You learned how to read or you just fell by the wayside. Sure. sure. Well, I wish we had more time to talk right. about it, but it is an incredible book. It's called My Dyslexia, and it, it's incredibly powerful and beautifully written as well. And, and Philip, it's a, I wish only we had more time. It has been such a pleasure <laughs> speaking with you. It's a pleasure. Too. Uh, I've been speaking with Pulitzer Prize winning poet Philip Schultz. My name is Suzanne Parker. Um, please check out our creative writing program at Brookdale. You don't need to be a student to take the classes, and information is online at www.brookdalecc.edu. Um, thank you for watching and please watch us next time.